my name is probably the hardest part of this presentation <laughs> to pronounce it. So uh, today I'll talk about improving Magento performances asynchronously. So um, it's not maybe the first thing which com comes up to your mind when you are thinking about improving per performances, but yeah, it, it could be very useful. And today I'll show it, uh, I'll first give some introduction to the common practices uh, when we are doing some performance analysis and improvements. And then I'll give some use cases how we can improve it asynchronously. Mm. Yeah, okay, so my name is Sinisha. Uh, I'm CTO of, of e-commistry. It's New Zealand-based company and that's my playground when I where I can test all my uh, crazy ideas. So yeah, I'm, I'm working, uh, I'm working uh, with Magento in the last six years, and yeah, f f that's actually my first uh, uh, point of touch with uh, e-commerce. And at that point, I thought that what can be so complex there? You know, you have, you just have to uh, pick a product and just pay for it. Yeah, and in the next six years, yeah, I realized that it's not that simple <laughs> most of the time. Yeah, also. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, AWS uh, in general, so uh, I'm using, using that in the, my daily basis. So some of those solutions will be uh, based on AWS services, but also they can be uh, applied to the regular hostings. You, know, you can uh, run anything you want. Um, Okay, performance. Uh, as I said, like you say in Bolt, always can, can run faster. So yeah, I'm pretty sure that he could run faster if he wanted. So it's like performance. Uh, you're never, never uh, satisfied. You're always thinking that it can be better. There is always something which can, can be improved. So those are some typical issues um, uh, which we are facing with, like um, high time to first byte slow checkout, not necessarily whole checkout, but for example, there is a lot of websites where you're waiting a uh, couple of seconds to place the order. Then, uh, yeah, long time waiting for exter external processes which are not that important for the customer itself. Uh, then, inability to scale up single CPU process. Uh, PHP in general, it's, it's a single, single um, CPU process. There is multi-threading, but it's not commonly used. So that's one, one of the things which, which also can make uh, some issues to us. So I'll just start from simple shop. Yeah, this is some, something pretty common. Uh, you have client, uh, I know, load balancing, multiple instances, and database. Uh, the next uh, let's say, common approach to the infrastructure is to improve it to look something like this, to make it um, more fault tolerant, to deploy instances to the multiple zones. So if, uh, I don't know, you have a website in the USA and uh, Europe, if uh, USA zone you know, fails, you can redirect all, all your clients, visitors to the Europe instances. Uh, yeah, there is also some additional services here as uh, uh, Redis, which is called Elastic Cache in uh, AWS terminology, and et cetera. Yeah, but how to handle spikes and unexpected traffic increase? Because uh, not every day in, uh, no, in, in whole year, I, I'm pretty sure that all of us have some spikes, some um, uh, promotion periods when we have to handle increased traffic. So here are some common solutions, vertical scaling, which means uh, we, can, um, we can add more CPU and uh, memory, but at some point uh, we can go further than that. Then uh, horizontal scaling, we can add more instances 
it has also some limits. For example, you can add, I don't know, read replicas, but uh, at some point your m master database will be bottleneck. Uh, in Magento Enterprise Edition, you have ability to, to use multiple master databases. It can be, it can improve some things. Caching also has common solution. When we are trying to improve performances, we, we are always trying to find some places which can be cached or pre-warmed in advance. CDN, uh, today CDN can be used even for caching uh, static, static content uh, like HTML pages, uh, section IO uh, gives a good, this is not commercial for them, but yeah, they, they have some good possibilities. And the last thing, we are out of capacity. I think that um, if you are not able to serve your customer, it's more fair just to say, okay, we don't have enough capacity at the moment, uh, rather than uh, keep them waiting for until uh, request get time out. So those are some typical solutions. Yeah. So uh, there are ways how we can push those limits further, uh, and I find them more convenient uh, than those regular. And also one thing that I want to say uh, before I start uh, talking about asynchronously, um, I would like to say that it's most commonly, it's, it's good to be applied to large scale, scale websites. You don't have to use it maybe for, for small websites. You know, that just doesn't make sense. Uh, it will introduce additional complexity, uh, more headaches, I don't know, et cetera. But for large scale, it makes sense a lot. So <coughs> about performances, so it's not always about measuring um, how big memory footprint is, uh, how, uh, how much CPU power is used, et cetera. For customer, which is our the most important thing, uh, we should be customer centric, uh, it's most important how, how customer perceives it. So there are some techniques uh, uh, front-end related, which are commonly used, like uh, optimization above the fold content, which is, I know, pretty common use, but I'll focus on, uh, on stuff which are happening in the background. Oops. Yep. So, one of the solution is, um, as I said, the customer doesn't have to be bothered with your integrations, which means uh, you have to be careful what you're going to execute during regular request from the customer. So, for example, when the order is placed, you don't have to push uh, order data immediately to our external services. You can um, push it later. So as it states here, so identify all external processes executed during the request, request and identify all non-mandatory tasks from customer's perspective and execute them asynchronously. So what is the most common approach which I saw in the last you know, couple of years on different implementations with Magento? So yeah, there are some groups, companies, which are thinking if they push the data in an event observer, that it will, be, it will be executed somewhere in the background, not during that request, which is not true. Uh, mostly, uh, most common solution is to make a current job which iterates our table, for example, on every hour, and to identify what has been changed. For example, if you have to synchronize, uh, or if you, we have to synchronize any kind of data, we can make cron job which iterates over the table and just to push differences. So that's one of the common approach. Uh, other one is to check all rows, all data with uh, some kind of field is processed and when it's processed, you can set it to one. So those are all some common approach, but I do not consider them as uh, good approaches. They can be good for small merchants, but for li large scale, it's not good. So message queue, that's 
that's the central point uh, of the talk today. So uh, it allows us to, on the proper way, to make a set of, <coughs> to schedule job or work which have to be done with, uh, with some other processes and we can execute it uh, beside the main point of execution. So we can execute it asynchronously. So what is message queue in general? It's kind of uh, middleware. It consists of a lot of messages. So um, the most common pattern used is pub publish subscribe. This, uh, this picture represents um, how message queue looks in general. So the most important thing is message broker. Uh, and you as a publisher, you can push something like, uh, I know, order ID, order data, which have to be processed somewhere. Uh, then we have exchange, which uh, binds topics. Uh, it uh, makes decision uh, where our data should be routed in what queue. And at the end, we have subscribers or consumers, which will consume that data. Uh, one of the most common protocols used in message queue is AMQP. And that's nowadays, it's one of the most common. Uh, earlier, there was, for example, in Java, there was a JMS, JMS uh, which was good, but it wasn't, uh, it was good just for Java. But if you wanted to integrate with uh, some other uh, platform te technologies, then you can run into the issues. Uh, that's, what, that's one of the things which was solved with AMQP protocol. It standardized uh, how message should, should look and all processes process around it. Some of the most popular message brokers, uh, RabbitMQ. Uh, RabbitMQ implements uh, AMQP uh, completely and it's one of the most popular nowadays. Amazon SQS, actually Amazon um, doesn't provide fu fully compliant MQP solution, but yeah, it's, it's regular queue which can be used and uh, um, I'm using SQS on a daily basis on, among all of my projects. Uh, Beanstalk, Apache, Kafka, they, they are not um, you can't consider them as a real you know, message queues, but they can serve kind of, as kind of uh, message queues. Kafka is more like stream processing. I'll um, come back to it uh, in one of the use cases where, where we can uh, maybe use it. So what are benefits of using message queues? Um, decoupling components, that's the first benefit. So, uh, especially in Magento 2, uh, all, the main goal is to decouple all components so we can replace every component whenever we want. Maybe it's not possible at, at this moment for all components, but that's goal and that's, that's uh, what, what should be possible, at least. Then one of the other benefits is integration with third-party services. So, Message queues can be used as a mutual language for, for different services. So you can push some uh, data which is understandable by all the integrations. Then we can defer resource intensive operations, which is nice, nice um, thing. And it can uh, help us to improve not really improve performances because uh, at the end, if you sum all time spent, you'll be at the same. But the point is that you can easily scale that uh, without customer knowing about that. Reliability, uh, called, uh, it's called like graceful degradation, which means if we have two services and uh, for example, consumer, I don't know, fails for some reason, uh, with message queues, we are not, we are not going to lost any data 
because message queue can ho hold that data as a buffer until this service consumer, uh, I know, uh, got fixed or um, uh, restarted, whatever. Um, just to point out some um, support for message queues, those are two solutions, uh, open source solutions which are av available for Magento One. Uh, I'm pretty sure that there are more solutions. I just couldn't find it uh, on first page of Google, but I'm pretty sure that there is uh, more. So there are more solutions for Magento Two. There is already uh, support for Enterprise Edition. Uh, uh, Magento 2 have Magento Q framework and uh, it uses RabbitMQ as a message, messaging broker. Although it has adapter for, for MySQL, I'll speak about that later. What's our pros and cons of that? So configuration can be done depending on the Magento version. In Magento 2.0 it's, it's done just via QXML where you have to configure uh, all your produ producers, uh, consumers, topics, uh, routes, bindings, etc. In Magento 2.1, it's separated to the queue and communication XML, and in Magento 2.2, is split down further to the four XML files. In general, it doesn't make too much difference. It's easy to migrate from 2.1 to 2.2. You just have to split uh, your consumers and publishers which were part of QXML, now you have to split it to Q consumer, Q publisher, and to define binding in Q topology. Uh, I'll show just one example for 2.1. Why 2.1? Well, I had some issues to put all four examples, or four files <laughs> on one slide, <laughs> so I found easier 2.1 as an example, but yeah, it's the same. So. As you can see in communication XML, you can define all topics where we are pushing our data, and in queue we can defi define uh, uh, consumers and how the data is, is going to be consumed. Also, you can run it from command line. There are a couple of commands. Uh, for example, what can be done? If you are pushing something, some work into queue, then on separate instance, you can, for example, run uh, queue consumer start uh, five times. And what you're doing that way, you are executing uh, five worker instances where each one uses one CPU. So if you have eight cores, uh, yeah, you'll get the most of it. Uh, publicly available solutions. Renato Casson made, made some public available solution. I have mine. Uh, I also improve. I, I, I'll push some additional things until the end of the year. That was my idea to to make it uh, available for everyone. Also, I know that there are some. Uh, I think. Um, there is an initiative to make message queue available for Magento open source. I'm not sure at what stage it is, is going to happen, yeah, but at least there are some uh, open source solution for now. Database is a queue. Yeah, it can be used as a backend uh, for low volume tasks, tasks and uh, yeah, but it's not actually message queue. It can be I consider that as a bucket of the jobs. No, it's not a real message queue. And there are some problems uh, which, which are coming with, uh, with uh, MySQL, MySQL as a, as a uh, backend. Like, um, for example, you have to, pull, uh, to do polling to check if something is changed, something, uh, something new came then we can possibly have a problem with the locking tables. If you have to update that table, uh, then data growth. So at some point, that table can be uh, too large, etc. All those uh, things can be, there are workarounds, but still, it's not perfect. 
solution. As I said, it can be used for some low volume tasks and yeah, in the beginning, if, you, if your website is not uh, 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 developed for la large scale for a lot of customers at the same time. So some of the use cases, how to make the most benefit from using message queues. Uh, this is typical flow, where, which, what, what is happening when we are placing order. I just, um, I picked just um, what was important for me to show you what can be optimized or deferred. So this is typical flow. You have to authorize credit card to create order, send email confirmation, update admin panel grids, and probably to push your order data to some other third-party services. So what can be improved? Magento 2 comes out of the box with some solution, for example, for email. Uh, you can enable uh, asynchronous sending of emails, uh, which is good because uh, there is no reason to fire email immediately after order, order it is, pl is placed. It's okay if you send email um, one minute after with some cron job, whatever. Another thing is uh, order grid. Uh, beside the uh, main order table, we have grid table, which is used for uh, rendering uh, grids in the admin. Uh, we can update this grid immediately after order is placed, or we can do it later. And one of the things that uh, uh, we have used even on, on Magento 1 to make it possible to place uh, more than 200 orders per minute. This is how, how we managed to do it, uh, one, of the, one of the things. So uh, when you are going to place the order, you don't have to charge customer immediately, right? You can just pre-authorize the amount you need then you can reserve order increment ID and you can show success message immediately to the customer. It doesn't take too much time. It's a pretty quick solution. I think that even customer could, could think that uh, they didn't place the order properly. <laughs> it's that, that fast. And then in the background, uh, you can pick such a uh, such job and create order from the quote, capture, really capture uh, amount, desired amount of the card, and send email notification. So this is approach that we have used and it works well. Uh, there's one thing just to mention, uh, not all, not all uh, payment gateways support this. Uh, also some payment gateways can charge you additionally for authorizing uh, card and then charging it. So it depends, but for example, CyberSource works well with it. Another use case, subscription services. So if you are selling some subscription-based content and if you have, uh, I don't know, a few thousand uh, or more um, customers, then at some point, at the end of the month, you have to process all those subscriptions to create orders, to charge their cards. And if you are doing that, that sequentially, you can finish it maybe in the middle of the month, you know. <laughs> you can charge customers, you can finish charging all the customers at mid middle of the month, although they expect it probably at the first day of the month. So what solution here? Yeah, we can, we can publish, uh, let's say, subscription ID into some queue, and then we can run multiple consumer processes which will take, in, take uh, one by one subscription, create the order, charge the credit card, and send, and send all email notifications related to that. Uh, logging, um, yeah, by default, as you know, um, all logs are kept in one log directory they can easily become large uh, if you're not uh, I know, uh, rotating them, they can be one gigabyte even. So yeah, it's unusable at some point. There are few solutions, solutions on the market, uh, 
but I'm going to present how we are doing that uh, in our company. So we are using Amazon services. We're using SNS for uh, creating topic where we are pushing all uh, exceptions, uh, system log data, everything what we want. We are pushing to SNS, which goes further to the queue. And then we have uh, Lambda, which is function as a service, which further uh, process that log data, push that to the elastic search, and then we can search through all the logs with Kibana. Um, as I said, we are using Amazon, but it, this also can be done uh, on all other hosting solutions. Uh, you can use RabbitMQ as your message queue. Uh, instead of AWS Lambda, you can use regular instances and to run some kind of you know, cron jobs which will read uh, those messages from the queue, process them, and push the data further. Uh, what's good about this? Uh, it's scalable. Uh, on Amazon, it's scalable by itself, so you don't have to worry about any of those uh, layers. Uh, in outside of the Amazon, if you are using some instances to process those messages from, from message queue, uh, yeah, it, they can fail. But as I said in one of the previous slides, we have uh, graceful degradations, so. Uh, all messages will be still in SQS. So yeah, we can wait until those instances are recovered and process the rest of the messages. Cache cleaning, for example, yeah, that's, that's uh, one of the things which is, which is done in the admin. Uh, for, for example, merchandisers, they are changing a lot of data on the products. Uh, and every time we save product, we are invalidating a lot of a lot of uh, cash uh, cash data. So it can be deferred. Also, uh, mass import we can defer some things. Uh, we don't have to bother merchandiser with that uh, because uh, just imagine merchandiser who had to change a lot of products if, if he have to wait a couple of sec seconds each time it can be a problem for him at large scale. Uh, and the last one would be integrations. So, yeah, uh, I saw many times that uh, people are sending data immediately after all the displays at, for example, at success, success uh, page. So yeah, that's, that's not good. Uh, what we can do here, we can push all the data to the message queue, then we can consume it further with order management, inventory management, analytics report, whatever we have. And one of the benefits of this is uh, each service can consume it at their own pace. So it's normal that all those third party services, they cannot work at the same speed so it's good to allow them to do it at their own uh, tempo. Graceful degradation, so yeah, some of those services can fail. We c now we can wait for them to recover. Um, disadvantages. So yeah, one of the disadvantages of uh, using message queue is that represents another point of failure. Uh, that's not a good thing, but yeah, that's something which comes up with uh, with uh, large-scale applications. Then there is more work for DevOps. Yeah, but if you're a developer, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, it adds some additional complexity to your architecture, yeah, and it's tough to perform end-to-end -end testing. You know, it's, it's not that easy to push something to a queue and then to see how it behaves. So it's it's not that easy, but it's achievable. There are a couple of more disadvantages. For example, uh, depending on the way how you configure your message queue, you can persist all messages. If they are important to you, you can choose to not persist them. If you can reply the content, then uh, also depending on the config configuration, 
if you are if you are having a replica replication of the message queue, uh, it may happen that your messages are not uh, coming in the same order uh, how how you push them. So all your consumers have need to have that in the mind, <laughs> know uh, that it will not be in the same order every time. Uh, one of the other thing, uh, one message can come twice to the consumer. So that's also one additional thing which have to be uh, solved. Uh, yeah, you, you can, for example, you can choose uh, to have a deduplication at exchange, but uh, it slows down your message queue. So it's pretty important to know to know uh, your consumers. Uh, is it a problem for them? And uh, you have you need to have that on your mind when you are developing consumers. They have to be idempotent, which means that the same data can be consumed and executed as many times as you want without making some side effect. Um, yeah, and one of the tweets which I saw recently, which is talking, which can be applied to message queues, uh, this is exactly what what can happen. <laughs> Those two most uh, common uh, problems. Yeah, so that's all what I had to say on this topic. Uh, I hope um, all, all of you will find some bits which can be applied to your daily work. And yeah, uh, feel free to ask me anything about this. I'll be in the speaker's room or everyone here. So yeah, I will answer all questions synchronously, not asynchronously. <laughs> so yeah, that's all.